Mr. President. Senator from New Hampshire. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would ask that the quorum call be rescinded. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I come to the floor today to talk about an issue that I am deeply concerned about. And that is, while I appreciate the work that was certainly done uh, by Congressman Ryan and Senator Murray on the recent budget agreement, there is a provision in this agreement, in my view, that makes it a deal breaker. And that provision is that there is $6 billion taken from our current military retirees over the next 10 years from their cost of living increases to pay for this budget agreement. I believe that we do not have to take from the backs of our men and women in uniform to pay for more spending. I believe that there are ways that we can find $6 billion in trillion dollars of spending, trillions and trillions that we will spend over the next decade rather than taking it from the men and women in uniform who have sacrificed the most for our country. What troubles me most about this particular provision of this budget agreement is that our military retirees that are under the age of 62 were singled out. There is no group under this agreement that is cut, that their benefits are cut. In fact, there are some changes to the contributions that federal employees will have to make to their retirement, but those changes are only made prospectively to new hire hires. Our men and women in uniform were not grandfathered under this agreement. They're the ones, the only ones, that were singled out under the agreement to have their benefits cut now. What I find most appalling is a question that we asked and we pressed and we pressed the Department of Defense for, and that is what happens to our disabled veterans, because when Unfortunately, many of us have been to Walter Reed. We've seen the injuries that our men and women in uniform have sustained, fighting on our behalf in Afghanistan. Some did multiple tours in Afghanistan and also served our country in Iraq. And when you have a disability that occurs in the line of duty, you are entitled to a disability retirement and this agreement will also cut the cost of living increases for our disabled veterans, which I find appalling, uh, particularly some of the horrific injuries that many of our, too many of our men and women in uniform have sustained defending our country uh, and taking the bullets for all of us. Under this agreement, an E-7, a sergeant first class who retires at age 40, could stand to lose $72,000 by the time he turns or she turns age 62. To put that in perspective, the average retirement for an E-7 is roughly $25,000. And so in that period, this cut of 1% to their COLA could equate to $72,000. And think about the impact that has on our veterans and our men and women in uniform who have done so much for our country. And why are they being singled out in this agreement? The other issue that I want to raise is this notion that some have said we have to vote for this agreement or we're going to face another government shutdown. I think that's a false choice. We may be in a rush to get home to our families for the holiday, but the notion that we can't find $6 billion somewhere else 
on a bipartisan basis for our men and women in uniform, that's a false choice. We can keep this government open, we can address the budget issues, but we should not do so on the backs of our men and women in uniform that are singled out in this agreement. Right now, as this agreement stands on the floor of the Senate, the tree, so-called amendment tree, has been filled. That means that any amendments that either side would want to offer cannot be offered right now because the majority leader has filled every part of the amendment tree, not allowing individual members to offer amendments. Were I allowed to offer amendments, I have filed two amendments that would address this issue for our military and have found other pay-fors to address the issue. And those are just two ideas that I came up with. And I'm sure that if we committed in this body to working on this issue, that we could quickly find $6 billion that would not be taken from the backs of our men and women in uniform, would not be taken from the backs of our disabled veterans who have already suffered too much on behalf of our nation. I do not believe that this is too much to ask of us here. We are blessed to be in this country and blessed to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy in this country because of our men and women in uniform and what they have done to defend our nation. And make no mistake, a military retirement is not like any other retirement. When you retire from the military, you understand that you can be called back. You can be called back at any time, and who's most likely to be called back? Our younger veterans. In fact, since 2001, thousands of our veterans who thought that they were going back into civilian life have been called back by our government to serve their nation again. They didn't get to say yes or no. They had agreed that they were going to do that even though that they thought that they would be retired. That's what distinguishes a military retirement from other retirements or an average civilian retirement. They earn this for defending our country. I believe we should fulfill our responsibility to them that they should not be singled out. Of all the groups to single out, they should not be the group to single out, and particularly everything that they have done for our nation. So, Mr. President, here's what I ask. I would ask that we take a few moments in this body that we come up with six billion dollars some other way instead of taking it from the backs of our men and women in uniform that why don't we have an amendment process that would allow us to address this issue would allow us to fix this now and to those who are saying we'll fix this later that is such a Washington answer if you're serving our country right now in Afghanistan, what kind of comfort is that to you that we'll fix this down the line after we vote for this agreement? How about fixing this now? I ask my colleagues to fix this now on behalf of our military, the best in the world, those who have sacrificed the most for our country. And if this body is to pass this agreement, I would call on our Commander-in-Chief to veto this agreement. Bring us to the White House. Make the House, make the Senate sit together and resolve this issue. As the Commander-in-Chief of this country, don't accept the cuts to the military and have our military retirees singled out, particularly our disabled veterans in this agreement. We can get this done. We can get this done before the holidays. Yes, we'll suffer some personal inconvenience, but think about that. That is nothing compared to what our veterans have done for us and continue to do for us every single day in this great country. So that, with that, Mr. President, 
I yield the floor. Ms. President. Senator from South Carolina. Thank you. I would, uh, one, join in with a senator from New Hampshire and Alabama trying to urge the body to take a pause here and see if we can uh, right a wrong before it uh, uh, matures here. Uh, the good news is that we had a bipartisan agreement to try to fund the government in a fashion where we would not have uh, government by crisis. I appreciate that. I understand how hard it is to reach a consensus around here. And uh, our objection is not to the, at least my objection is not to the deal as a whole. I appreciate the fact that sequestration relief uh, occurred for our DOD budget for two years and non-defense spending and it was paid for. I appreciate that very much because sequestration is really uh, cut into our ability to defend this nation in a dramatic fashion. And to have it paid for uh, is also a, uh, a worthy thing to, to do, the right thing to do. What Senator Ayotte's uh, trying to, uh, the point she's trying to make, I'm trying to make, and I think Senator Sessions is, uh, budget is about your priorities. You know, what we're doing here today is we're telling everybody in America what's important to the Congress, the Senate, and the House when it comes to getting a budget passed for two years. and. Uh, how we should do this, how should we pay for it. Here's what I can't understand. Of all the groups in America that you would go to and single out, unlike any other group, to pay uh, for the offset to come up with some money out of their pocket to get this budget deal passed, which doesn't keep us from becoming greased by any means, but I do applaud the effort. We picked the military retiree community. And here's what we've done to our military retirees, past, present, and future. We have taken their cost of living adjustment, reduced it by 1% until they get to the age of 62. And if you're E7, a master sergeant in the Air Force, who retires at 42 in 2015, by the time you get to 62, this 1% reduction of your COLA a year uh, amounts to almost $72,000 in lost benefits. Do you know how much a master sergeant with 20 years of service makes in retirement? It's less than $25,000 a year. So that $71,000, almost $72,000 number is requiring that master sergeant to give up three years of retirement because $25,000, $24,000 a year is what they make for a 20-year period, the cost of the COLA reduction is almost 72000 So basically, you've taken three years of the retirement away to do a budget deal that could be accomplished without having to do that to our military. And nobody else in the country is doing this, by the way. No Social Security recipient has given up a dime. The COLA formula for the military is exactly the same as Social Security and other COLAs that we get around here. Now, should we look at reforming our military retirement pay pension benefit system? Yes, because it's unsustainable in the future. Entitlement growth in the military is real just as it is in the civilian side. But nobody has ever envisioned picking it, doing it this way to take the military retiree community and retroactively apply a benefit cut to them that takes $6.3 billion out of a retiree community. These are the people who have been fighting the wars for 20 years. These are the people who have been serving continuously since 9-11 overseas and at home trying to protect the nation. And this COLA reduction doesn't just apply to people who have retired and in good health at 40 or 42 or 45. It also applies to people who are medically retired. Someone's had their legs blown off in Afghanistan or Iraq who are not going to be able to get a second job most likely. They're going to lose thousands of dollars of cost of living adjustment and nobody else in the country is like situated. Can we do better? You better believe it. Now here's what Congress told the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission. We set up a commission last year 
to advise the Congress next year how can we fairly adjust retirement packages to make the uh, personnel costs more sustainable in the Department of Defense in the future, and how can we do that fairly? You know what we told the Commission? We mandated that any change they recommend uh, has to grandfather existing forces and retirees. We put it in the law that created this commission. We put a restriction on the commission's ability to come up with pension, pay, and benefit reform by saying you cannot apply it to people who have already, who are in, who have signed up expecting certain things. They're grandfathered. Well, we should have told ourselves that. We limit the commission, but we do exactly what the commission is not allowed to do. Now, I don't know how you're going to explain this when you go back home. I hope somebody will ask you what you're trying to accomplish up here. Trying to have a bipartisan budget that avoids a government shutdown is a good thing. But asking the people who have been on the front lines of defending this nation, who have been in the military for 20 years, and do you have any idea how many times the average military family moves in 20 years? Do you have any idea how many schools their children will attend because they move every couple of years? Do you have any idea what it's like to serve this country since 9-11. All I can say is that if you want to find $6.3 billion over the next decade to pay for this budget deal, you can find better alternatives, alternatives than this if we just take some time. If you don't like what Senator Ayotte's doing, there's other ways. I'm not asking a Democrat to defund Obamacare to keep the government open. I'm not asking a Democrat to take away a safety net from a group of Americans who are struggling. I'm not asking a Republican to raise taxes. I'm asking both of us before Christmas to rethink what we're doing here and put a little bit of time to fix a problem that quite frankly is unconscionable. If you make over $250,000 a year in retirement, you receive $109 a month subsidy to pay your Part D prescription drug bill. And here's what I would say. If you want to pick on rich people, let's do it. To me, $250,000 puts you in a category of living pretty good. Why in the world does our government give you $109 a month to pay your prescription drug, drug bill when we're broke as a nation. That subsidy alone is worth $54 billion over the next 10 years. What if we took some of that money? What if we went to the $250,000 retiree and say, would you give up some of your subsidy to pay your drug bill so a military retiree doesn't have to lose the retirement benefits they've earned and they have fought so hard to defend this nation for so long. I bet you they would say yes. Here's the point. We're going to rush through this thing. And if you ask me what bothers me the most about this, is how insensitive we've come as a nation. We, we go, we trip over ourselves to welcome the troops home when they come back from deployment. Members of Congress want to be there when the guard unit leaves. We want to show how much we love the troops. That's a good thing. Every American, Republican, Libertarian, Vegetarian, Democrat, we all love the troops. But your Congress is expressing that love in a very strange way. What? How far have we fallen? Do we have no shame as a, as a body? elected by the American people to, def to make sure the nation is well run? What's the proper first role of the federal government to defend the nation? Tell me how you defend it without people willing to die for it. You know, the budget doesn't defend this nation. The CBO, the OMB, and all these acronyms do not defend the nation against radical Islam. So I'm urging my colleagues in a spirit of bipartisanship and a spirit of common decency 
do not single out the military retiree who has served so long and so hard and ask them to give so much when others are doing almost nothing. As to our federal employees, you're being asked to contribute more to the federal retirement system, and I'm sure that is a burden. But what do we do to federal employees? We say that everybody who's in the system today does not share that burden. They're grandfathered. It is only for people that are hired in the future. But as to the military retiree, thank you for all your hard work. Boy, do we have a deal for you. This is not going to stand. This is going to pass because everybody's hell-bent of getting out of here and going home and celebrating a bipartisan breakthrough. And we're going to talk about how function how we've become functional again, and I, and I do appreciate the effort to become functional, but to me, in our effort to become functional, we have lost our way and, quite frankly, lost our soul. Any political body who would do this in the name of good government has forgotten what government is all about, is far by and of the people. And I tell you right now, from the CEO to the doorman, when they hear about what we've done to pay for a budget deal at the expense of the military retired community, they're not going to be very appreciative. And I, and I promise you this, if we don't fix it now, not only are we going to review it, we are going to fix it. And to our president, there's only one commander in chief. How could any commander in chief sign a bill that does this? Mr. President, call us down into the White House, put us in a room, Republicans and Democrats, and don't let us out until we find a $6.3 billion offset that doesn't do injustice to the military retired community. If I were president, I sure as hell would do that. Nobody would be going home until we got this right. So, Mr. President, you owe a duty to the troops greater than everybody because you're their commander-in-chief. I don't know if we're going to get this fixed. The train is running, and the military retired community is on the tracks, and a few of us are trying to get them off. I promise their families that if we fail today, we're going to come back at this tomorrow over and over and over again until the Congress finds its soul. I yield. Yeah. Madam President, Palmer. let me just say, first of all, my good friend from South Carolina has, uh, is a mind reader. Uh, he always looks at you and figures out what you're going to say, and then he says it better. So uh, let, let me share. There are a couple of things during this discussion that haven't been said. Now, I just want to mention that, and then I know we're going to go ahead and vote on this. And one, one is that... Our military was told, and I talked to several of the groups, the, the, the uh, military, the retirement groups and others, that they would be grandfathered in. Now, I want everyone grandfathered in if you're going to do something like this. Certainly in one ins installation in my state of Oklahoma, we have 14,000 civilian employees. They're going to be grandfathered in. I want them to be grandfathered in. That's the right thing uh, to do because, you know, people make career decisions predicated on what they're told at the time. And, and these military guys, and, and I, I look around the room and most, uh, most of the senators who are in here have spent a lot of time, as I have, over in Afghanistan, Iraq. We talk to these guys and talk to them in the mess hall, and they talk about what their careers, how they happen to get in here. Well, they make these decisions, and then we come along and take it away. I think it's been said enough about the example of the, uh, of the, the uh, gunnery sergeant at age 42, having been in for 20 years. It's going to cost him some $72,000. But with not, not much is said about the officers. And the officers, it's actually a lot more than that. If you get an, e, uh, an 05 officer at that age in the same circumstances, he would lose $124,000. These are not wealthy people. These are people who depended upon this for their retirement. Now, I want to mention also that they were told, as I mentioned, they were told that they also, the military people, would be, uh, would be um, grandfathered in. Now, any time you grandfather in, then obviously they change the rules. The new people making a career decision 
will make it predicated on the, those circumstances of retirement that are there at that time. I, I have to say this, that uh, tomorrow we're going to be um, involved in the bill that was put together by the big four, and it's the NDAA. It's a must-pass bill. We will pass it. I can't imagine there won't be the, the votes to pass it. But I can tell you this, uh, Madam President, that if we had known this was going to come up, we would address this in the NDAA. This is something that could have been addressed and could have been offset. So uh, I, I agree with everyone who has spoken on this. I think it's a, uh, something that is just very difficult to understand how this could happen. And we do know this, that one of the differences between civilian employees and military employees, you can't recall civilian employees. We have a figure here. Are you aware, Madam President, that we have actually, since September 11th, recalled 3,456 military retirees that have been recalled to duty? Every one of them is going to be affected by this. And, and this is the travesty that we cannot allow to happen. I applaud my friend from Alabama for bringing this up, and, and hopefully we'll be able to correct it. We're going to have a vote here in, well, right now, and, uh, and I, I hope that this is, the, is a solution to it. And then tomorrow we'll have a chance to get into the detail about the NDAA bill, which is the, a very, very significant bill that addresses things like this. And with that, I yield the floor. Sorry. Senator from Alabama. Madam President. I thank my colleagues for their heartfelt remarks about the cuts that are in this bill that will immediately impact uh, the retirements of American military. And they are subject to recall to active duty. Uh, they are expecting these payments and other departments and agencies and government employees are not going to get their retirement reduced, only people who served in the military, and it's not correct, and it should not happen. But what I want to emphasize to all my colleagues and highlight for us to hear today, that the legislation before us now is brought forth in a way that will not allow any amendments. If people have an idea about a problem with this legislation that was agreed to in secret by a couple of senators, I suppose, maybe some staff involved. So they agreed to this language. It's the first time we've seen it. It's the first time it's been before the light of day in the Senate, and we find problems with it, real problems. Now, if you ask school children, if you ask senior citizens in America, if a bill hits the floor of the United States Senate and it's got bad provisions in it, what do you do, Senator? Well, they'll say, you offer an amendment, and you fix it. That, wouldn't that, isn't that what we were taught? Isn't that what the history of the Senate is all about? It's a place where you can debate, and you can amend, and you can improve legislation. But we're in an odd, unusual circumstance. Not so odd in recent years. The majority leader of the Senate has sought recognition, as he's able to do, and he's filled the amendment tree. And nobody can get an amendment. Nobody can get a vote on this amendment uh, to fix this part of the legislation that plainly needs fixing. It's not available to us. That's awfully hard to believe. It's awfully hard to believe that in the great Senate, as Senator Robert Byrd said, there are two great Senates, the Roman Senate and the American Senate. And he defended it and its rights and priorities. But we have one leader of the Senate, supported by his colleagues, who says we don't want amendments because we might have to take tough votes. And all we want to do is rubber stamp this agreement, this bill written in secret, and we want to pass it without any amendments. How did that become the policy of America? How did that become the policy in the United States Senate? What justification can be given to the concept that duly elected United States senators can't stand up on the floor of this body and defend their rights of their constituents and their states by offering amendments to improve legislation. And we're going to have tomorrow the defense bill spending authorizing this expenditure of over $500 billion. 
$500 billion plus to fund our military. A lot of people have ideas about how to improve that bill. We're not going to get a single amendment because the majority leader has filled the tree. And he's going to deny the members of this body who represent millions of people in their states, and really we represent everybody, the right to offer amendments to improve that bill. And it's contrary to our tradition, it's contrary to our heritage, it's contrary particularly to the heritage of the United States Senate, where open debate and discussion is so important. So I thank Senator Wicker. He spoke this morning. Senator Ayotte, Graham, and Inhofe, who shared their thoughts about the lack of wisdom in this legislation. And I'm going to uh, offer here a tabling motion. And the purpose of it will be to remove the, the parliamentary maneuver of Majority Leader Reid and allow us to have a vote. So I want to say to my colleagues, what is this amendment about? This amendment will remove the filling of the tree and it will allow the Senate to vote on this amendment and other amendments perhaps, but this amendment in particular. I believe that is in the tradition of the Senate. I believe it's extremely important. So, Madam uh, President, uh, I would ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending motion so that I may offer a motion to concur with amendment number 2573, which is filed at the desk. Is there objection? Madam President. Senator from Washington. Madam President, reserving the right to object, and I will object, but first I want to say that as many of my colleagues here know, I have dedicated much of my career to fighting for our nation's veterans and our military families. I am the daughter of a World War II veteran. I am the first woman ever to chair the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. I have worked time and again tirelessly to safeguard the health care and the benefits and services that those in our uniform have <laughs> sacrificed for. So obviously any provision that impacts them or the benefits that our service members have earned is of great concern to me. But Madam President, as is true with any very difficult compromise, there are certain policy changes in this bill that I would have never made on my own. Thankfully, though, we wrote this bill in a way that will allow two years before this change is implemented, two years, so that Democrats and Republicans can keep working together to improve this provision or find smarter savings elsewhere. In that time, I know that there is an Armed Services Mandated Military Retirement Commission due to report their findings, which would give both chambers time to legislate a solution before any COLA change is ever implemented. I also know that the senior senator from Michigan, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, has indicated he is going to move forward with efforts to review this change before it takes effect, and I support that effort. And I am quite sure that other members of the Senate will look for ways to replace these savings in a different way. In other words, we can and we will look at other, hopefully better ways to change this policy going forward. But opening up this bill to changes today after the vast majority of Congress has voiced their support for a deal that ends the repeated crisis we have faced in this nation is not the solution. In fact, Madam President, jeopardizing this deal right now only threatens our national security, and it will force layoffs of those very service members and civil civilian military personnel that so many members have come out here to speak for. As with any bill, the oversight process here in Congress will move forward the moment we pass it, and there is no doubt that improvements will be made where they are needed. But this motion, I tell my colleagues, is an effort to bring down this bill to stop us from moving forward, and for that reason alone, it should be voted down. Therefore, Madam President, I object, I object to the unanimous consent. Will, will the distinguished chairman yield on her reservation? Uh, the senator does not have that right. The senator does.
floor, I believe. I, I believe that's right. Um, I would yield to the senator for a question, and I, uh, and I don't I don't mean to to prolong this, but I I did want to ask the, this of the distinguished chairman. I, I I do think everyone should understand that although um, the uh, the senator from Washington chairs the committee and uh, was a member of the conference committee, this this is not a report of the conference committee, and. And um, I would, the, the, the question I want to ask is did the negotiators realize when this, one per, when this uh, COLA less 1% provision was inserted in the conference committee that it would mean $80,000 lifetime out of the, the retired pay of the typical uh, enlisted retiree? Did, did the conferees realize the magnitude of what they were agreeing to? Did the two negotiators agree the magnitude of, uh, of what they were um, sending to the House and Senate? Madam President. Alabama yield to the Senator from Washington to answer that question? I, I would be pleased to yield to the uh, Senator without yielding the floor to answer that question. Without objection. Senator from Washington? Madam President, I would suggest that the Senator ask that question to Chairman Ryan. Uh, but I would say again, as many of us have talked about here today, this isn't the deal that Democrats would have written on our own. It is not the deal that Republicans would have written on their own. Nobody got everything they wanted. And we each had to give up some things to get to where we are today. Madam President, again, to bring us back to a time of certainty. Because without a budget moving forward today, we would be facing a time in a few short weeks where would, there would be dramatic changes and cuts to, in particular, our Department of Defense, meaning furloughs and layoffs and a threat to our national security, as so many members of the military have told us. So, Madam President, I hope that we can move forward. I know that we're going to go through some parliamentary inquiries and a motion here in a minute, but I hope that our members would uh, take the time to say, what is the end process here and vote with us to not, uh, to not change this at this point and to allow us to go forward and bring certainty to so many families across this country at this holiday season time. Senator from Alabama has the floor. Madam President, I wonder if the Senator from Alabama would yield to me for uh, 60 seconds. Senator would, from Alabama. I would yield to the senator without yielding and, the floor. And I would, I would ask the senator from... Without uh, objection. Thank you, Madam President. I would ask the senator from Alabama. It, it seems to me no one wants to claim parenthood uh, of this very onerous penalty on the retired service members of the United States of America. Uh, I would have to infer from the, the senator from Washington's answer that she was not aware the one percent from COLA sounds so innocuous, but when it comes to a to one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for officers and eighty thousand dollars for enlisted people, it's real money. This is a penalty, and it's hitting the people that step forward and volunteer to serve our country and protect our security. And and so uh, until someone is willing to step forward and claim ownership of this, I have to assume that the negotiators didn't know the, the impact that this would have on our military retirees. And it seems to me that the senator from Alabama has devised a way to surgically remove this provision, pay for it elsewhere, and send it back to the House. And I think we'd be doing them a favor, frankly. And I thank my friend from Alabama for yielding. Well, I thank the senator. Um, I would notice Senator Ayotte has spoken, Senator Graham, and Senator Wicker, um, along with myself, were conferees on the Budget Conference Committee that this was supposed to be the kind of thing we would discuss, but we weren't called to final discussion, and uh, some legislation is brought to the floor now that we didn't have time to uh, approve what, in would advance. The, would the senator yield for a second? Uh, senator Graham uh, from South Carolina, I would... I'm pleased to yield for a Thank question. Thank you. Uh, to follow on what Senator Wicker said, I've been trying to find out how this started to begin with, too. Whose good idea was this? So I called the Secretary of Defense and said, we didn't do this. 
I talked to Chuck Hagel. I said, this did not come from us. Because I said, what are y'all doing over there? Please understand, Senator Graham, this did not come from us. Now, I think Senator Wicker knows the exact number, but if you're a military retiree on your DD-214 form, Senator from Alabama, I don't know if you know this or not, but when you get your retirement, your discharge, DD-214, at the bottom it says, subject to being recalled. Do you know how many military retirees have been recalled since 9-11? I do not, Senator Graham. I think the senator from Mississippi may have the exact number, and it amounts to a brigade of soldiers, almost. Senator from Mississippi, well, well, the number? Well, the senator would, would yield for an answer to that. Uh, precisely 3,456 DOD retirees, the very people we're penalizing in this provision, have been recalled to active duty since September 11, 2001. So, Senator Graham, you're full colonel in the Air Force, still serving in the reserve. Yeah, take um, my pay. <laughs> bless your heart. But uh, it's a fact that this retirement pay is really more than retirement pay, is it not? It's really uh, a, a income, a, a source of payment that ensures that the person can be recalled. So it's part of the right to recall you a compensation. For well, well, the answer is that when you retire after 20, you're subject to be recalled as long as you're physically able. And I guess I know one individual was recalled at 56. He was a JAG officer who had been out of the military for years, set up his practice, and he said, can they do this? And I said, hey, man, you're the lawyer. <laughs> of course, Reed, you know they can do this, and they did, only because we had to, and he went and did his part. Now, I bet you those 3,400, some of them were volunteers, some of them were not. But the cost of living adjustment is to make sure your retirement over time maintains its value. That's why we have a cost of living adjustment. And how much money do you make if you're a master sergeant after 20 years of service? It's less than $25,000 a year in retirement. So it's not, these people don't become millionaires when they retire. Try to raise a family of four on $25,000 without a COLA. So the, the COLA is designed to keep the benefit uh, vibrant over time. And when you do a COLA minus 1%, it does diminish the value of the package. And here's what just gets me the most. If we did it for everybody in the country, that would be one thing. These are the only people in America that get this special good deal. Madam President, I, I thank Senator Graham. I think he made a defining point there that uh, this is a one-sided uh, reduction of retirement benefits to people who served in the military, not impacting lots of others. I just want to re report, return to the central point here. This bill that will be voted on tomorrow, final passage, cuts military retirement by six billion dollars. That six billion dollars is counted in the numbers of the proponents of the legislation toward their justification for spending more money the next two years. They say they're paying for it by reducing this six billion dollars over time. And it's mandated. It's not an option in the bill. We should not pass legislation that does that. So what I would propose is that we not go along with Majority Leader Reed's determination to run the train over the men and women of our military, that we slow down and we follow the regular process of the Senate, not fill the tree, and allow amendments to be voted on, on this substance, substantive matter. So parliamentary inquiry, Madam um, President, is it Senator correct? will state his inquiry. Uh, is it correct that while the majority leader's motion to concur in the House amendment with an amendment to which the majority leader has also offered a second degree amendment is pending, while it's pending, no senator is permitted to offer an amendment to the House passed spending package? Senator is correct. So let me repeat to be sure my colleagues and I understand the situation. The chair has just told the Senate 
that I cannot offer an amendment to the House passed spending bill that would strike the military retiree pay cut because the majority leader has filled the tree with his own amendments. I've read the majority leader's amendment, and I see they are merely, they merely change the date of uh, at an enactment by a few days. Further parliamentary inquiry, Madam President, if a motion to table the majority leader's motion to concur with an amendment is successful, would there be an opportunity for me to offer an, a, a motion to concur with Amendment 2573? Yes, there would. Again, summarizing for my colleagues, the presiding officer is telling this Senate that if there can be 51 votes to table the current amendment tree to the House passed spending bill, then there will be an opportunity for me or other senators to offer uh, by motion uh, a motion to concur with the amendment that strikes the military pay cut. So, Madam President, in order to make a motion to concur with the amendment 2573, I move to table the pending motion to concur with an amendment offered by the majority leader, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a second? The yeas and nays have been requested. Is there a sufficient second? Yes, there appears to be a sufficient second. There is a sufficient second. Uh, Senator from Washington. Madam President, I would just state to all of our colleagues that this motion will br it's an effort to bring this bill Madam President, there's no debate on the Debate motion. is not in order. Jack. The question is on the motion. The yeas and nays have been ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. We say uh, Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Balkus. Mr. Baggett. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, What's that? Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, 
Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. I'm just trying to do it the right way. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. As always. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Do you have me down there? Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Hyde Camp, Mr. Heller, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven. Yes. Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane. Mr. King. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. 
Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Alexander, Barrasso, Burr, Chambliss, Coates, Cochran, Cornyn, Crapo, Enzi, Fisher, Flake, Graham, Inhoff, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of Wisconsin, Lee, McCain, McConnell, Paul, Portman, Roberts, Sessions, Shelby, Thune, Vitter, Wicker, Mr. Blunt, I.
Mr. Heller. Aye. Senators voting in the negative. Baldwin, Brown, Coons, Durbin, Franken, Gillibrand, Heinrich, Kane, Klobuchar, Leahy, Manchin, McCaskill, Merkley, Murray, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Sanders, Schatz, Schumer, Stabenow, Tester, Warren, White House. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, no, Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, no. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Coburn, aye. Mrs. Boxer, Mrs. Boxer, no. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Scott, yes, sir. Mr. Scott, Aye, Mr. Risch. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Levin. Mr. Levin. No. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Donnelly, no. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, no. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, no. Mr. Booker, Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no. Mr. King, Mr. King, no. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, no. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, no. Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Ayotte, aye. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Kirk, Mr. Kirk, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, no. Ms. Heitkamp, Ms. Heitkamp, no. Ms. 
Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus. No. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, no. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of Colorado, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Pryor, Mr. Pryor, no.